Good afternoon, everybody. Again, good to see you here. Greetings to all of those going to be out on the videotape program. Uh, it's certainly good to be able to fellowship with you uh, here in person and also all of those out uh, on the extended tape program. I was sitting watching television the other night, and the interviewer brought this elderly lady on, and she was sitting there, and you could tell by the look of her face uh, the wrinkles that had been embedded in her face over a process of years looked like a road map of trials and tests and problems that she had experienced over a, a long, long period of time. And as the interviewer asked her to explain why she was there that night, she began talking. And as she began talking, a picture of a 14-year-old girl flashed upon the screen. And she began to explain about her daughter that had been captured by these two gang members. And the two gang members had kidnapped her, taken her, and violated her in every conceivable way that a man can violate a woman. And then after they had finished with her, they began to pummel and beat her face with a blunt object until it was unrecognizable. Then putting her in the trunk of an automobile, they took her out, dumped her on the side of the road, and then ran over with a car. Now, the reason the lady was on the television screen was that the man that had committed that heinous act over 20 years ago that had a life sentence hanging over his head now received a state of execution because it would have been cruel and unusual punishment to put a needle in his arm. So, according to a, an attorney that was there, said it would probably be at least two more years before the man would come up and face the execution again. But the look on the lady's face and, and her explaining about the loss of her daughter and the suffering that she went through for 20 long years, of how at night she would wake up in a cold sweat, of how she tried to sleep but couldn't do it. And during the course of the day when you try to free your mind of the pressures, it just comes into your mind and overflows you and you get this feeling of helplessness. I don't know about the people that was watching that show that night, but I shared in her grief. In fact, we've had a lot of grief to share in lately, haven't we? I still see pictures of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast states that were destroyed by two horrendous hurricanes, Katrina and Rita, and how people still are misplaced from their homes, how people's lives have been turned upside down of how families are living apart. Children are living in one town. Parents are living in another. People have lost jobs. They've lost homes. They've lost hope in so many cases. One of the things that still haunts me at night is the picture of the little girl that I saw in the, the newspaper and I guess because I can identify with my little granddaughter who was about the same age, of how this pervert had taken the little girl and had molested her and then buried her alive. I can hardly comprehend that. I just put my, my little granddaughter in that position or any other of the children that I know, and it is hard for me to take. And I wonder, how are the parents dealing with it? How can the father and the mother how can you go on with that type of situation occurring in your life? And so many times we, in God's church, we suffer too. I know of a lot of people that I talk to. I know a lot of people that I've met through the years that have experienced horrible, horrendous problems and tests and trials in their life. And I know that their lives are filled with pain. The sorrow is there. The, the expression has gone out of their face, hollow-eyed, empty inside, wondering, why do I want to go on? What's my purpose in life? What's it all about anyway? I mean, what's the use? What I was living for is no longer here. What I was looking forward to has already gone. All my hopes have been shattered. All my dreams have been destroyed. So what's, what's it all about? And we've, we're filled with that. And I talk to people on the telephone 
And I receive letters from people that tell me I'm lonely. I'm afraid. I'm sick. I'm dying. And I go to God and I say, God, do you hear their prayers? Do you hear what they're telling you? Let me interject on their behalf. And I do that. And people will ask me why. Why is God allowing this? Why is God doing this to me? Why is God not listening to my prayers? Why doesn't God intervene? Does He not hear my prayers anymore? Have you ever wondered that? Day in and day out, you're on your knees and you're praying to God for Him to deliver you from a particular, a particular type of trial or situation. And you ask God to, to intervene and you're looking, give me a sign. You ever ask for a sign? You ever want him to just show you some little significant or insignificant thing that would give you a clue as that he heard your prayer? Did you hear me, God? The next day you go back and say, God, did you hear what I asked you yesterday? Did you hear what I was praying to you yesterday when I asked for deliverance? I wanted, I wanted you to intervene on my behalf. I wanted you to help me get through this. Do you not care anymore? Have I done some heinous sin? That has separated me. You know it says in Isaiah that our iniquities separate us from God. And you begin to question your religion. You begin to question where you stand with God. Where, where in the grand scheme of things are you? And then you, you begin to reflect back and say, Well, God, I know you called me because I couldn't understand the truth had you not opened my mind and revealed it to me. And you said to come unto you, Christ, those of you that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Did you not say that? Did you not promise that to me and to your people? And yet, you wonder why. You know, we aren't the only ones that experience that. And I would venture to say that everyone sitting in this auditorium today and everyone that's listening to me on the videotape program out there are suffering. Why are we suffering? Why must we suffer? Why must we go through what we're going through? Why must we deal with the loneliness? Why was, must we deal with the betrayals? Why must, we, why must we deal with the loss of loved ones and the loss of pets? Why must we be tormented by our neighbors and, and the people that are in the world and sometimes even from members of our own family? Why is it on a daily basis that we have to suffer like we do? Let me read to you something that David said over in Psalm 88. Now this was a man that was after God's own heart. This was a man that God worked with from his youth that helped him slay a lion, helped him slay a bear, that guided that little sling, that pebble that went right between the eyes of Goliath. There was no question in David's mind that God was working with him. He sent a prophet down after Saul had re rejected God's uh, commandments and he was going to replace Saul with David and anointed him as a child, took him from the sheep coat. And here was a man who knew God was in his life, who knew that God was working with him. Now notice what David says in Psalm 88 and verse 1. O Lord, God, my salvation. He knew that the only way he was going to enter into eternal life was through God Almighty. I have cried day and night before you. Many times it says in the Psalms, he says, My bed was wet with tears, pouring out of his eyes. Because there was so much agony inside, he couldn't hold it back any longer, and he just cried out, My God, my God, why do you not hear me? Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear unto my cry. Listen to me, please, he says. I need your help, and I need it now. For my soul or my life is full of troubles, and my life draws nigh unto the grave. He was approaching death. There were, there were problems that he was experiencing with his health. Now, you know about David. You know the problems he had with Michael, his wife. You know the problems he had with Saul, who chased him down and, and tried to kill him during his life. You know how he felt when his very best and closest friend, Jonathan, was killed, and, and the messenger come to him and told him what had happened, and how he slayed the messenger that brought that, that horrible news to him. You know what David went through, how his son tried to take over the throne. You know the scenario, how he maneuvered and manipulated, and how he forgot about God and gave in to his lust with Bathsheba. 
And now how he tried to get out of it and he, and he wove the web and got tangled up in it of how he sent Uriah the Hittite to the front of the line. And you know some, something about Uriah the Hittite? He carried his own death sentence to the front of the line. Would you have looked in that note, that letter? I wonder how many people would be that loyal and that faithful to their, to their superior that he didn't even look in the letter that he was carrying to the commander on the front line. But he plotted, planned, schemed, and had his life snuffed out. You see, David was a man after God's own heart, but he was human, and he made mistakes. And can you imagine some of the thoughts that had to be pouring through his mind? He numbered Israel, and it cost the lives of thousands of people. You know, if I would hit anybody with a car, or if I would cause anyone's life to be snuffed out, it would haunt me the rest of my life. I'd never get over it. Just like an elderly gentleman that was in the church years ago, and I can still remember the, the, the strip of road that he was traveling across, and the sun right there in the afternoon, it just sit right at the end of that highway, and it just blinded you. And the old man came, came by, and the school bus stopped, and, and he apparently didn't see it, and he went around it and hit a little child, and he killed it, and he never, ever got over it. I don't know how you could. I mean, it would be something that would just haunt you. It was an accident. It didn't have to happen, but it did. And he certainly didn't mean for it to happen, but it did. And there are situations in our lives that things happen, and they bear on your mind. You remember what Paul did? Remember how Paul, or at that time was Saul, persecuted the church of God, and he actually held the cloaks of those men who stoned Stephen to death, and he actually had notes and letters signed where he was given permission to go out and persecute the church, actually bring them in and have them crucified. He had to live with that for the rest of his life. And it haunted him. You see him bringing it out in his writing from time to time. He, he couldn't get over that. So it says in verse 4, I'm counted with them that go down into the pit, down into the grave. He said, I'm as good as dead. You ever feel that way? You ever worry about, is this my last day on earth? Am I so sick that I, it, God is going to claim my life now? Will he give me another day? We wonder sometimes. I've been so sick sometimes I wish I would die. And, and then when I started getting better, I was thankful I didn't. I'm, I'm glad God didn't answer my prayers. But it says in verse 5, Free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave, whom you remember us no more. Now God doesn't remember us in that grave anymore. He remembers us, but he's not acting in our lives on an active basis once we're dead. You know, that's it for us. From the time that we're born till the time that we die, and then once we die, we're asleep. You know, dead, dead people are they're at peace. They don't have the problems that you and I have. They are completely and totally at rest. They have no worries, no bills to pay, no family members that they have to deal with. They don't have to worry about persecutions of any type. They don't have to worry about wars, rumors of wars, diseases, famine, pestilence. They are asleep and they are resting. And it says that God takes the righteous away from the wrath to come. He takes them out of this world. You know who, the, who has the problem? Those that are alive. Those that are still here. We're the ones that suffer. But once they're dead, they are asleep. You ever look into a casket at someone's face and their eyes are shut? They're not in anguish. You don't see their, their face is twisted. You don't see the wrinkles. You don't, you don't see the veins pooched out along their neck. You just don't see that anguish in their face. They're at rest. They're at peace. Verse 6, You have laid me in the lowest pit in the darkness and the deeps, your wrath lies hard upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your ways. What is David doing here? God, you have afflicted me. You have caused me severe problems. And he's talking about like the waves of water just keep rushing up on him. They don't stop one right after the other. Isn't that the way it is with our lives? We no longer get through one trial till we're hit with two or three more, do we? You, you don't get through worrying about this problem till this problem crops up over here, sometimes two or three of them. There is no rest. There is no peace. You just can't get by it. And he says, Selah, which simply means pause, think about that for a few minutes. You have put away mine acquaintances far from me. In other words, his companions left him. They deserted him. You have made me an abomination unto them. I'm shut up and I cannot come forth. My eye mourns by reason of affliction. His eyes mourn because of the afflictions that he has. Now, you can read in other places, it's possible that David may have had a stroke. And it said that all of his, his friends, he would not come around him because they also thought that he may have had something contagious. And you know, they practiced quarantine through the uh, pages of the Old Testament. 
So when someone's sick and they thought that something was contagious, you quarantined them, you didn't come around them. But he was completely and totally alone going through his afflictions. And I've called daily upon you, and I've stretched out my hands unto you. See, one of the positions of prayer would be on their knees, and they'd stretch their hands up to God. And I've stretched up my hands to you, he says. Will you show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Selah, let's think about that. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave, or your faithfulness in destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark, and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? What's he saying here? He says, if I die... I can't pray to you anymore. I can't praise you anymore. I can't teach anybody about your law anymore if I'm dead. So he's crying out for help. But unto you have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent you or come before you. Lord, why cast you off my soul? Why hide you your face from me? Well, there's David thinking that God has forgotten him. And God had already entered into a covenant agreement, or he enters into a covenant agreement with David and says, through you, David, there will always be a descendant on your throne. And he says, you're going to rule in the world tomorrow. David's going to have a high-ranking position. And yet sometimes we forget, don't we? Sometimes even when God is working directly with us, because we're afflicted so much, we can't see the forest for the trees. We can't see the promises for what we're involved in at that particular time. I'm afflicted and ready to die. He says, from my youth up, all my life, he says, it's been hard. And I guess that's pretty much the way it is with us, isn't it? All of our life, we've had some type of problem to deal with. While I suffer your terrors, I am distracted. Does it distract you when you're being afflicted, when you're suffering? Are you able to pray? Are you able to study? Can you keep your mind focused on what you should keep it focused on? Sometimes it's difficult. When that child of yours is laying in that hospital and you don't know whether they're going to live or die, it's hard for you to get down and pray, isn't it? It's hard to focus, and yet we should, as we'll see in just a moment. Your fierce wrath goes over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about altogether. Lover and friend have you put far from me and mine acquaintance into darkness. David was having some problems, wasn't he? So all of the great men and women of the Bible suffered. They suffered immensely. Some of them far greater than what you and I have to go through. And I know that many of God's people are suffering now. Why is that? Are you wondering where God is? Are you wondering why? The wicked sometimes seem to prosper and everything seems to go right. They always get the best job. It seems like they get the best shift. It seems like there are healings in their life and miracles seem to happen. They win the lottery and uh, everything just seems to go right for them. Are you wondering why their, their life seems so much better than yours? Well, it's time that we understand that. And I think that if we do, and if we can understand why we suffer, why we must suffer, I think it will help us along the course toward the kingdom of God. And that's my purpose today is to help you understand that. Let's notice 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. It's, it's uh, rather remarkable to me that God chose Peter to write this. Peter, a man who denied Christ three times. And yet Peter, after he was converted, and the tradition tells it that Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified the same way his Savior was. And I was reading a story the other day that said Peter knew they were after him for preaching the truth and he was able to escape and go out of the city and to get away and he got outside the city and he got safe and he turned around and went right back in and was crucified for preaching the truth. So Peter changed his life went through a lot of tumultuous situations, just as yours and mine does. But now here's Peter saying, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, be sober. That doesn't mean don't drink a lot. It just means be sober. You know, don't be too frivolous. Don't keep your mind off on things that are not relevant and pertinent. But be, be sincere. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion, and he's walking about 
throughout the earth, seeking whom he may devour. You know, he loves it when you suffer. He loves to see you in agony. He loves to see you squirm. He loves to see you get into a point where you look up and say, God, I don't want to follow you anymore because I know you don't love me. You couldn't love me. You couldn't care for me and let me be going through what I'm going through right now. Satan is gleefully chuckling in the background, wringing his twisted, perverted hands because he thinks he might have an opportunity to devour you. He may have an opportunity to slip into your mind when you let down and be able to put thoughts into your mind of doubt. And that's the first step. Once he gets you doubting, once he gets you focusing on not on God, but on, on your particular problem, then he has an inroad with you. And he says, Whom resist, telling us to resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing this. You see, sometimes you look at the world and you think that everything's going good for them. But he says here, Know this, that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It's not any better for them. In fact, it's better for you because you know something they don't know. They have their problems. The lady I was telling you about on television, she has no clue about what God's truth is, and yet she suffered. And I watched another situation just the other night where this little boy, 11-year-old, in Kentucky, where th this lady had gone to school, picked him up after school, took the little boy out, and she did it for uh, the mother's husband's new wife, and she wanted to make the, the ex-wife mad, and so she choked the little boy on the way home and killed him and took his body out into a field and burned him up. Now, living and dealing with those types of situations, that's not uncommon. That's not uncommon. All you have to do is open your eyes and look. Look at some of these television programs about the cold cases and the people that have been murdered and killed and people whose lives have been just completely and totally disrupted. They're, they're, they're suffering too. But you see, they don't understand why. They don't know God. They think they do. They may think they do, but they don't know the God that you and I know. They just don't know because God hasn't shown himself to them yet. But you see, you know the God, the creator, the sustainer, the supreme lawgiver, the master designer of the universe is a special God. And that God has called you. He has worked with your mind. He's taken the scales from your eyes and he's shown you something that the majority of mankind cannot see. And he, he shows you a picture and it says in Corinthians, eye has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of the man the things that God has in store for you. It can't come to the carnal mind. They can't comprehend the kingdom of God. But he says, what things know the things of a man except the spirit of man that is in him? What things know the things of God except the spirit of God that is in you? You see, through the Holy Spirit, you're able to understand, you're able to see down into the future, and you're be, being able to grasp and comprehend what it's like in the world tomorrow. Oh, I know that we can't fully grasp it because we're not spirit, but you can, you can comprehend a world, can't you, in, where, in which there's no crime? Can you comprehend a world in which there's no locks on the doors? in which there will never, ever be any pain? Can you comprehend that in a world in which you'll never, ever get sick again? You, where the lame can walk, the blind can see, the deaf can hear, where there's nothing but peace, where there'll be no hurt in my holy mountain ever? Can you comprehend that? Well, that's what God says you've got to look forward to, somewhere down the line. Now, why must we suffer, though? Why must we go through what we're going through to get there? It's important you understand that. Because once you understand why, it helps you to deal with it so much better. 1 Peter 2, back a couple of chapters. Verse 21. It says, For even hereunto were you called. You want to know why God called you? Well, you know. You say, well, he's, he called me to be a member of his family. He called me to occupy some administrative position in the world tomorrow. That's why God called me. You know, he's forming his government right now. He has already got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Samuel, and uh, Isaiah, and all these men he has qualified during their lifetime to occupy a position of governing in his family. And it says, here is why you were called. Listen to what it says. Because Christ, here's why you were called. 
Christ suffered for us. You were called because Christ suffered for us. And then he called us because Christ did all this suffering. Leaving us an example that you should follow in his footsteps. You want to walk with Christ? You want the mind of Christ? You want to be like God? You want to walk with him? You want to enjoin arms and walk hand in hand toward the kingdom? He says, I will live in you. I will walk with you. I will embrace you. Then you've got to do something. Notice verse 20. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. And then it says, then why were you called? You were called to suffer. I don't like that. I didn't, I didn't bargain for that. I thought that if I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Master and personal Savior, and I obeyed Him to the best of my ability, and I became a better person, that my life would be a bed of roses. I didn't realize that back in the early 70s and the late 60s. But that's what it says. And now that I think that I'm spiritually mature, now at this point in my spiritual life, I think I can understand it, which I couldn't have then. My eyes were only being opened gradually and slowly, and I was being led to a point, as with all of you, to where you could grasp and understand and to digest spiritual meat. We started off on pablum. He gave us milk. He brought us along. But as we reached certain milestones in our life, we encountered difficulties along the way, didn't we? And with each difficult situation that you had to encounter, you grew a little bit. Even though you may have suffered. Even though you may have cried out, My God, why have you forsaken me? My God, why are you not hearing me? And then when you get on the other side of it, you can see why you had to go through what you went through. You were stronger, you were closer to God, and you understood it better. So we've got to follow Christ's example. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Isaiah 53 Verse 1, who has believed our report? How many people believe our report? How many people believe what we try to tell them about the kingdom of God? How many people listen to the good news of the kingdom of God? How many people even understand it? How many people understand we try to tell them God is not a trinity, but God is a family, and they'll shake their head and say, get out of here, you're some cult. How many people believe our report, and to whom is the arm or the power of the Lord revealed? I can answer that question. To many of you sitting in this room today, and many are out there listening on this uh, program today, you are the ones that believe the report, and you are the one whom the arm, the power of God has revealed it to. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He's talking about Christ. He has no form nor comeliness, and when you see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him, giving us some idea of the physiognomy and the looks and appearance of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men. Despised. You know, we as human beings will go out of our way trying to get people to like us. You can't believe the things that human beings do trying to make other people like them. They will gravel at their feet. Sometimes they will just do all types of servitude for them. Anything to try to make the person like them. And yet, we don't want to be despised. But Christ was despised and rejected of men. He was a man of sorrows. And he was acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. We didn't recognize him for what he was, it says. I know I certainly didn't until he opened my eyes and began to reveal to me who he was. I didn't realize who Jesus was, and I didn't realize that I was trampling on underfoot every day His holy commandments. I didn't realize that. I didn't know that. 
when I was doing some of the things that I did, breaking the commandments of God, and I just didn't know it. Jesus Christ, if you can put yourself back in his day, and here is Joseph and Mary planning to be married, and then this angel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you're chosen among women, and you are going to give birth to the Son of God. And you are not to have any type of relationship with your husband or your husband-to-be, at that time they were betrothed, had not been married, and until after marriage, until after your son is born. Well, it's not hard to tell after about seven or eight months that a woman is pregnant, some more so than others. But here was Mary in the community with all of her friends, and they're beginning to look at her swollen stomach, and she's not married. And they begin to point the finger. You prostitute. You've been out. You've committed adultery. You've broken the laws of God. And then when Christ was born into the world, they continued that. And when he went out to play, and he'd go over to little Johnny's house, or uh, Ezekiel's house, or Isaiah's house, and the parents would say, you're, you're that little bastard child, aren't you? He had to live with it all of his life. Even when he grew up, remember when he confronted the Pharisees and Sadducees? And he told them, he says, uh, they said, we're of Abraham's seed. And uh, he said he was the son of God. And they said, uh, we are not a bastard child. And somehow they put it like that. We are not born of fornication. That's how they said it. And that's what they were alluding to. He had to live with that all of his life. He's rejected by his friends and even his family members until they began to call his brothers and sisters. They came into the knowledge of the truth. Jesus Christ was a perfect child. He was in perfect obedience to his parents. You ever see children who call you Miss Goody Goody? At school, you try to do what's right, and they get out after class, and the kid says, what are you trying to do? Butter up to the teacher? Just because you're nice, because you say yes ma'am, no ma'am, because you obey the rules and guidelines of the class. Well, Christ always did. He never once disobeyed his parents. Do you think the brothers and sisters didn't like that? Why don't you just one time, just one time do this? And he never did. And so he had to take the persecution from it. Christ said in Matthew 23 and verse 37, he looked down at Jerusalem. He saw, now think about this. Who's Christ? Jesus Christ was a creator. He created all these people that were there in Jerusalem at that time, and he saw them trampling underfoot his royal law. He saw them suffering. He saw them agonizing. He saw them going contrary to the way. He came to them. They rejected him. They didn't love him at all. They didn't acknowledge him at all. And he says, you know, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you under my wings and, and protected you, but you wouldn't. And so he suffered because of that. You parents understand what I'm saying. You parents understand when your children do something wrong that causes them pain. You tell them don't do it, and they do it anyway. And then they get hurt from it, and they maybe end up in the hospital, or they end up, uh, you know, doing a crime or hurting themselves some way. And, and you suffer. I don't care. There's no way you can help them suffering. Even though you told them they're going to do it anyway, you're the one that suffers. Christ suffered when he saw his children in agony. One day he was out preaching and he got a message and he says, Lazarus is dying. And they said, come and you can heal him. Mary and uh, uh, her sister, they, Lazarus' his sisters, and they sent for him. And he says, I'll go. And he waited four days. And then when he finally got there, they said, if you had come, you could have saved him. And he looked around and he saw the Jews that had gone over. You know, when someone died, they went over and mourned with you. And, and they were all sitting around and weeping and wailing and they were moaning and they were crying and they were suffering and the sister came up and says lord if you had just come he said i told you that he wasn't dead he's just asleep but he's dead now and he went out to the grave and they said he's probably stinking by now he's probably in the process of decay and he it says he wept he mourned and it says he was swelled up with compassion inside when he saw the suffering that they were going through and he felt it too you know there's no way that we in god's church can't feel the suffering I've been around through I don't know how many funerals. And I always leave and I bear that suffering. It doesn't go away. It never, ever goes away. Oh, with time, it, it may lighten some way, but you still remember those loved ones. You still remember 
the people that you shared moments with. And, and it never goes away. Even though you, you try to go on with your life, and that's the way it was here with Lazarus. And those people, they had to deal with those situations. And then as it got up to the Passover evening, you know, everybody that he ever knew betrayed him on that night. You ever been betrayed? You ever had a real close friend or somebody that you could trust? Somebody you share your closest secrets with? Somebody you thought you could trust with all your life and you would be willing to commit to them and you find out they betray you? It hurts. And does it just, oh, oh well, no problem. It doesn't go away that easily, does it? No, you, you bear with that. You wake up in the middle of the night and you wonder why. Why did that have to happen? Well, why did Christ have to suffer? Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Hebrews 5. Why couldn't Christ just have come down here to this earth and was there no other way? I mean, surely we were all sinners. We all had the death penalty hanging over our heads. Surely, the God who designed it all, surely there could have been another way. But it couldn't be. Because God had already designed it back before the foundation of the world that the only way that sin could be forgiven was through blood. And it had to be through the blood of the one who created that was more important than the sum total of all the creation. It had to be that way. They had already designed it. They had already established it. It was a written law between, or an unspoken law between the Father and the Son that it had to be that way. Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. They knew that he was going to have to do that. They knew he was going to have to die. But it just seems like, why couldn't he just come down here and everybody love him and everybody like him and, and listen to his message? Wouldn't it have been so much easier? That's not the way he chose to do it. No, Christ had to come down here and take on the nature of man, and here's why. Hebrews 5, verse 6. As he saith also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who's Melchizedek? Well, that's another story, but we know that this is talking about Jesus Christ who took o over the priesthood in Melchizedek's order. And I, and I personally believe that Christ was Melchizedek. Who in the days of his flesh, while he was here during those 33 and one half years, Jesus Christ, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications. You see, Christ prayed every day. It says he got up early in the morning, went up into a quiet place, and he cried out to his father. His father knew him. He said in John 11, chapter, I'm thankful that you hear me always. So he was so close to his father that every prayer that he ever offered, he knew that he heard him. And he even said that. He says, Father, when he went up to Lazarus, he said, I know that you hear me always. He said, but I said it out loud so that the people could hear me and glorify you. When, when he comes up out of the grave, he said, I wanted them to glorify you. That's the type of person Christ was. So he prayed all the time. But God didn't always say yes to his prayers. We don't know how many times he talked to the Father and the Father said no. We do know three times, right before they, he was crucified, when he said, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But... We don't know how many other times he prayed to the Father, and the Father says, no, let's do it this way. So he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. Why? Because he was suffering. Because he was concerned about Israel. He was concerned about the people that were calling him these horrible, filthy names. He was concerned, and he was suffering. And that's why he cried with tears in that he was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Christ feared God. Do you realize that the only time for three days and three nights, the only time for all of eternity, as far as your mind can take you back, the only three times, three days, that Christ was apart from the Father was when he was in the heart of the earth. The rest of the time, the Father and he were together for all of the time. And he put so much confidence in the Father that he emptied himself of that divinity and became a man and could die. And when he died, if he went into the heart of that earth and if he had ever sinned, he would have never been resurrected. You think that isn't faith? He knew the Father. He trusted the Father. He believed in the Father. And when he went down, he said, Father, I commit myself into your hands. And he knew that exactly three days and three nights from the moment he went into the heart of that earth, he was coming out with full power and the glory that he once had with the Father before he was come to this earth as a man. He knew that. And so it says here in verse 8, Though he were a son, yet learned he what? Obedience 
How did he learn it? By the things that he suffered. You know there's something about suffering that brings about a closeness to God. You've got two choices. One, you can blame God. As David appeared to. He says, why are you bringing all these trials on me? But I'm sure he got out of that frame, frame of mind. But you can blame God for your problems and your trials. When you say, God, why? Why me? Of all the people. Reminds me of that skater the time when they hurt her leg. And she was laying down on the ground. And she said, why me? Why me? You remember that? Back in the Olympics several years ago. Well, why me? Why am I having to go through what I'm going through? It is enjoyable. Enjoyable. It's, it's not something that I want. But God must know something I don't know. It says he chastens us as children, and he chastens us for our own good, that we can get over or get past some flaw in our character. You may not even see it. You may not even know what it is. But he gives us a choice when we suffer. We can either turn against God, reject him, or we can stay the course and continue to go on. Now Christ said something back in John the 18th chapter. In John 18, I want this point to sink down into your minds. When you leave here today, I want you to take this point with you. I want you to remember it as you go back into your homes and whatever trial it is going to be waiting on you at the end of this service, I want you to remember this. This message should give you hope. This message should encourage you. It should help you to get through whatever it is that you're dealing with now, today. In John, the 18th chapter, in verse 31, here we are on a Passover evening, and we're picking up in the middle of a thought, and as soon as we start reading, I'm sure you'll understand where we are. You know that Jesus Christ had to go before Pilate, and he was going to be tested and tried there and judged. And then said Pilate unto them, Take you him and judge him according to your law. Talking to the Jews. Pilate didn't want anything to do with it because his wife had already told him. She said, I had a, a dream about this holy man. Leave him alone. But you know, we give in to pressure sometimes. And here Pilate was, was a most powerful man here. And he knew that if things were peaceful in his territory, then he may remain in his position. But, if he had an insurrection by the Jews, then they would probably send down someone down to put down the Jews and to replace him because he couldn't keep order within his realm. You've got to understand about politics. And he's playing politics here. He didn't want to find this man guilty of anything. He wanted to turn him loose. He says, oh, I've got an out now. Every year he says, you all can accept somebody and uh, I'd like to give him to you. Do you want to free him? He said, no, give us a Barabbas. We want to crucify this man. Well, he was getting himself in a bind. And so it goes on and says, The Jews therefore said unto him, It's not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into judgment hall again, and he called Jesus and said unto him, Are you the king of the Jews? Ask him a blunt question. Now, Pilate didn't know that. He didn't know who Christ was except through the rumors that he had heard. And Jesus answered him and said, Said you this of yourself or did somebody tell you? Well, he, he answered him. He says, I'm not a Jew. So he got it from the Jews. The Pharisees and Sadducees and chief priests had told him. He says he's king. Remember how they used to play on words and says, We have no king but Caesar? And the Jews were playing upon that and, and uh, they were trying to uh, stimulate Pilate to make his decision because he would be committed treason if Christ was claiming to be a king and he let him live. Well, that was a, a crime that should have been uh, a capital crime, guilty of death. So Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and your chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you, what have you done? Now notice what Christ said. And here's what I want you to remember. Jesus, at this point in time, being the Son of God, could have gotten out of his situation. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Now, won't you remember that? Your kingdom 
is not of this world. The kingdom that you're looking forward to, the world tomorrow, it's not of this world. You should have nothing to do with it. It says that which is of the world is filled with vanity and jealousy and lust and greed. And it says it will pass away, but the word of God will endure forever. So keep that in mind. Your kingdom is not of this world. You see, the kingdom that is of this world began back in Genesis, the third chapter. And I'm just going to quickly cover this to show you what I'm talking about. Genesis 3, and notice verse 14. And it says, The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this thing, he lied to Eve and was be able, been able to um, persuade Adam and Eve to reject the tree of life. Because you've done this thing, you're cursed above all the cattle, above all the beasts of the field. And up on your belly you're going to go uh, through the dust, and you'll eat it all the days of your life. Verse 15, And I will put enmity between you, Satan, enmity, hatred, between you and the woman, the church. So Satan the devil is going to be against the church of God, even back in the book of Genesis it was prophesied. And between your seed, the demons, and her seed, which would be the church, Christ's seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. And you women can probably testify to the fact that it isn't easy giving birth to a child. At least that's what they tell me. I don't know. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. He put the man over the woman. And unto Adam, he said, because... You have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and you have eaten of the tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. What happened here? And you go on and read how the thorns and the thistles began to pop up. God changed it. At, at that particular period of time, the Garden of Eden was perfect. There were no thorns, no thistles, no flies. There were no mosquitoes, no gnats, nothing that would bring any discomfort to mankind. But all of a sudden, the nature of animals changed. Lions no longer ate straw, but they became carnivorous. Uh, snakes become uh, poisonous. No longer were they playful little creatures that the child could wrap around their arm. And the whole nature changed of the animal world and in the plant world. And the nature of man changed. And it became filled with selfishness, Vanity, jealousy, lust, and greed, and therefore the nations of the world were established, built upon that as the foundation, not the love of God. You want to know why we're having so many problems in the world today? Because there's no way of peace they know not, because they rejected the law of God. And so when we come down to Galatians, the first chapter, here's what Paul calls it. In Paul's day, now what do you think he would say if he came down and looked at it today? In Galatians 1, Notice verse 4. It says, Who gave himself for our sins, talking about Christ, that he might deliver us from what? This present evil world. So you see, Christ said, My kingdom, what I'm here to prepare for, and he went on and asked him in the next verse, he said, But are you a king? And he says, I will be. That's why I was born. I, I plan to be a king, but not in this world, in the next. And you see, my kingdom is not of this world, but he came to deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So God intends to deliver us from this present evil world. Your kingdom, I hope, for those that are hearing my voice today, I hope your kingdom is not of this world. And we need to focus on that because the sufferings that we are going through now are preparing us for that world. Just as we are supposed to walk in Jesus Christ's footsteps, he suffered, and it says, you must suffer as I did. He learned what? Through the sufferings. Obedience. It is, it's like when, when you suffer, there's something that occurs that, for me personally, when I'm suffering, I pray more than ever. The scripture of pray without ceasing comes to mind. Every time that my mind focuses on a particular problem, then I go to God. It may be just be something like, God, will you deliver me? Will you help me? Will you show me if I'm doing anything wrong? Will you take these cares and, and give me an answer quickly? He doesn't always do it quickly. But I, then in that particular case, I said, well, then God give me the strength to endure what I have to endure 
so that I can get through to the point of time that you do decide to deliver it. Just, just help me. And Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But you see, we've got to do our part. We, we've got to take the scriptures and we've got to get up. Remember when Moses was at the Red Sea and he had all these millions of people behind him and Pharaoh was coming and you see the dust from the, the chariots and the, the soldiers that were coming toward, toward the children of Israel and the cloud came down and separated between them and Moses and the children of Israel and they had the sea behind them and Moses was there, he was praying, he was wringing his hands, what are we going to do? You brought us out here, God, you're going to kill us right here. And God says, get up, Moses, and go through the water. Get up off your knees and do something. That's what he told him. So he got up, and the wind began to blow, and it poured through that water, and the water began to spread back and just walls on each side. And Moses took him through the Red Sea. I don't know when God's going to take you through your Red Sea. I don't know when he will deliver you, but it says that he will. He says that he will. But he says you must suffer first because I want to know. And I, I've always wondered, and I think I know, but I wondered why God had to test Abraham with such a tremendous test. How many of us would be willing to take our own child up into the mountains and sacrifice him? I pray to God I never have to deal with that. But Abraham had to. He laid him on an altar, and for all practical purposes, uh, that knife began to come down, or at least he had it at the throat like he would have a lamb, and began to slit it, and they heard a rustle in the bushes, and God provided a goat to replace his own son. But then God says, Now, now that I have seen you go through that suffering, now I know. Do you think any of us are going to inherit the kingdom of God until God knows that we will never reject his truth, that we will never turn and go against him because there won't be any sin in the world tomorrow. He has to know. You're beginning to see why you have to suffer. God wants to see how you're going to react at your darkest moment. When you're lowest, when you're weakest, when you have no strength on your own, what are you going to do? You're going to look up, aren't you? You're going to look up to God. And you say, I can't do it. And then you might have to get up on your own and wipe the tears away. And you've got to find something in your life that gives you purpose to move on. That doesn't mean you'll ever forget the suffering that you're going through. doesn't mean that you'll ever forget. It should indelibly stamp into your mind something. I'm here for a reason. I'm here for a purpose. And God is, is allowing this so that he can put his character and his mind in me and stamp it so that I will never, ever reject it. I deal with people that are lonely. I deal with, with men that would love to meet women. Women would love to meet men. And they sit there day in and day out and nobody ever calls them on the telephone. They never get an email. They never get a letter. They never get up and go out anywhere and they never see anybody. And all they have to do is look at the walls. And their minds begin to toss over and they begin to turn and they begin to think and they begin to wonder and they begin to doubt. And they feel sorry for themselves and they go through a whole host of emotions. We deal with people that are, that are on the verge. As David said, I'm next to the pit. I'm ready to die. And, and we have people that are sick, and, and it just lingers on and on and on. We wonder, why, God? Why are you not intervening? Why are you not healing me? And right now, we have so many people that have gone through divorces. It hurts. I watched a daughter go through it. My wife and I suffered with her, not just for a few months, but for years. Years. It hurts. And sometimes you may never get over that hurt. But you must go on. The scars will remain. But you must learn from those lessons and move forward. And continue to go on. People suffer from paralysis, deafness, blindness, <clears throat> lack of jobs. I don't know what you're suffering from. But I can promise you one thing. You're suffering. And I know it. It may be that the husbands and wives are not getting along. It may be that the neighbors are persecuting. It could be anything. But I understand that there's a reason for it. You, Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, and I'm going to begin reading verse 6. It says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, now, 
at this particular period of time in your life, if need be, you're in heaviness. And it's okay to be in heaviness. Just don't stay in heaviness. Just don't stay down through these many temptations. But the trial of your faith, it's more precious than gold. The gold will perish, though it be tried with fire. And it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, your kingdom is not of this world, but you will receive it at Christ's appearing at His coming. And that's what you should be looking forward to. I wish I could go on, but I don't need to. I think I've gotten my message across. Your kingdom is not of this world. Jesus Christ suffered, and He learned obedience through that suffering. If we're going to walk with Christ, we too must learn to suffer and keep our eyes focused through prayer, through strong supplications, and staying close to God. If we can do that, we will have an answer to the question, God, why must I suffer? You'll know it so that you can enter into the kingdom of God.